This past week I was in Ardmore, Oklahoma at the conference there. It was a great conference. Met a lot of people from all around the country. And uh, I preached this message at the conference. And since I was there for the week and uh, just got back in late last night, I thought we'd do it here because I think it's something that would be beneficial for us also. And hopefully next week we'll be back in the book of Acts, uh, moving on in our study there. Let me ask you this morning, have you ever heard the expression, people don't care how much you know, what's the rest of it? Till they know how much you care. You know, I think there's a lot of truth in that, because personally I believe that we are influenced by the people who we think care about us, people we are close to, people who love us have the greatest influence. Now that's not to say the only people that influence, because I've been influenced by things I've read that people I don't even know, or you meet someone and they say something, or somebody inspires you, and you're influenced by them. At the conference, I had a man come up to me, and he goes, a 49 years old, been a Christian most of my life, never read through the whole Bible until I listened to some of your messages. You so convicted me that I started a Bible reading program and now read through the whole Bible. I tell you, I couldn't have got a greater compliment. I mean, if I can motivate someone to get in the Bible, that to me is the most exciting thing that I know of. But that was, that was encouraging. But I think for the most part, it's those people who really think we care about them that we have an influence on. They care about what we say. They want to know, you know, we, we can really touch their lives. Well, as Christians, we've got a message, the most incredible message in the world, that God in his love reached out to us, to provide everlasting life to all who will come to him in faith. And when we have the message of fulfilled eschatology, we know that so many truths that the word of God teaches. We understand that we live in the presence of God. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. We share the very righteousness of Christ. These are incredible truths. There's people out there that are hurting, that are miserable, that need to understand the word of God, but I think sometimes our approach just shuts people down, or sometimes our attitude or the way we deal with people, and I think we have to really reach out to people in love. I think there's nothing more powerful than love, and I think that's the motive. When people feel like we love them, we care about them, they're open to hear our message. Well, with that said, I want us to look at the question this morning, who's my neighbor? And the reason we want to look at this question and the reason this is important is because as Christians, we know that we're commanded to love our neighbors. Now, of course, we really can't do that if we don't know who our neighbors are. Or maybe we don't want to know who our neighbors are, so we don't have to be responsible for this. A man came to Jesus, <clears throat> Matthew twenty two thirty six, and said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And I think Jesus' response is very important here. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second's like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. Jesus said, I'm summing up the whole First Testament here. Love God. Love your neighbor. Well, Paul taught this exact same thing. In Romans 13, 9, he says, For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Galatians 5, 14, Paul wrote, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we understand we can't love our neighbor if we don't know who our neighbor is. So the command to love our neighbor is meaningless until we understand who is the neighbor we are to love? I mean, we think a neighbor, I think, in our culture, we think that's the person that lives next door. Well, even if that's true, do you love them? Is there a demonstration there? By the time you leave here this morning, I want you to be clear on what the Bible says about who your neighbor is. So you'll know who it is you're commanded to love. Now, in order to understand our text, we need to understand some background in the culture. You know, hermeneutics is the science of biblical interpretation. And if you don't understand hermeneutics, you're going to get really lost in trying to understand the Bible. And one principle of hermeneutics is you have to understand the culture. So let's try to do a little bit of that so we can try to grasp what he's saying here. In Jesus' day, there were seven schools of Pharisees. 
Now, I think today we think we hear the word Pharisees and right away we think hypocrite. But that's not true. The Pharisees were righteous people for the most part. They started out really right. Yes, they got corrupted and stuff. But the Bible says this in Matthew 5.20. I say unto you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Now, if the Pharisees are all hypocrite scumbags, does that make any sense? No. It'd be no big deal to surpass their righteousness if they weren't righteous. Well, these seven schools of the Pharisees all took the Bible literally. Now, the Sadducees, we know, didn't. They didn't believe in a resurrection, they didn't believe in spirits, you know, miracles. The Pharisees did. And they ranged from the most progressive school, which was the school of Hillel, to the most conservative, the traditional school of Shammai. And there were five schools which views fell in between these two. Now, these rabbinic schools were always arguing about how to interpret Torah. Or what, how to determine what is the proper yoke. See, the rabbis, and especially we've gotten into this in the past, the rabbis was shmika. Shmika meant authority. And there was a handful of rabbis in history who had what was called shmika or authority. They had the authority to come up with a new method of interpretation, and they called it their yoke. Now, this makes a little more sense when you read Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. He's talking about his interpretation of the Torah. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy. See, we think of that and we, we get all, but you've got to understand the culture. The yoke of the Torah is the way you take on the burden of keeping the Torah on your shoulder. You do it according to their method. Now, every rabbi had a different yoke. There were two different kinds of rabbis. There was rabbis with shmika or authority. Like I said, there was only a handful of those. And these men pretty much had the whole Tanakh, the First Testament, memorized. Now, if you can just even fathom that, the scope of having that whole First Testament memorized. And then there were rabbis who were Torah teachers. Now, every Torah teacher had the whole, uh, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, memorized. The Torah teachers would teach accepted interpretations. In other words, they couldn't come up with anything new. They would teach the yoke of the community. Now, if you wanted to know what a rabbi with Shemekah's yoke was, you would simply go to him and say, Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment? The Jews said that the commandments contradict each other by God's design, so they had to know which one was the greater. For example... Uh, Exodus 31, 14 through 15 says, Therefore, you are to observe the Sabbath. It is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. Whoever does any work in it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. For six days work may be done. But on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest. Holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. Now, is that clear enough? Observe the Sabbath. You don't work on the Sabbath. The Torah taught that. You would die, put to death, if you did. Look at Deuteronomy 22.4. You shall not see your countryman's donkey or his ox fallen down on the way, and pay no attention to them. You shall certainly help him to raise them up. They're not to allow animals to suffer. If they saw an animal in trouble, they were to help raise it up. That's clear enough also. But what do you do if you see your neighbor's animal fallen or in trouble on the Sabbath? We have two commands here. Observe the Sabbath. Another command. Help raise that animal up. You can't help an animal on the Sabbath. That's contradicting the Sabbath. So what do you do? How do you deal with that? How do you keep one commandment without breaking the other? And that's why they were always asking, which is the greatest commandment? Which one of those do we keep? you got to make a choice. The greater one you keep. Now with that in mind, let's look at Luke chapter 10. A certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Now, the lawyer here 
is not like Joins and Bieber, okay? It's not that kind of a lawyer. It's not some ambulance chaser, trial lawyer. The lawyer is a professional student and defender of the Mosaic Law. They taught the law. They enforced the law. They also judged. The Jewish New Testament puts it this way. An expert in the Torah stood up. I think that's very helpful for us. We think a lawyer, we, in our culture, lawyer means, you know, joins in Bieber. That's not what they're talking about at all. By the way, the Jewish New Testament is extremely helpful if you want to get some, a better sense of understanding the New Testament. Because I believe the whole New Testament was written in Hebrew. You know, many today say it was written in Greek. I don't believe that at all. These were Hebrews that wrote this. They wrote in Hebrew. That was their native tongue. That's where all, and there's a lot of Hebraisms in the New Testament, but you miss them in the Greek. And so you've got to go back to the Hebrew and understand what the Hebrew and these Hebraisms are saying so you can help you understand the culture. So this expert in the Torah came to test the yoke of Jesus. How did Jesus interpret Torah? And Jesus agrees with this man's interpretation. Love God, love your neighbor. Now remember, there's 613 individual statutes in the Torah from which to choose. All the schools of the Pharisees agreed on the greatest commandment, and that was love God. When asked, what is the greatest commandment, Shammai's school would answer, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Hillel's school would answer the same way. Jesus would answer the same way. Where did this come from? Where did they get this? Well, it came from right here. Shema Israel, Adonai Ukenu, Adonai Akkad. Hear Israel. That's what Shema means. Hear. Hear Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. This is a statement of identification. This is who they are. The Lord, he's our God. He's one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What text is this? Deuteronomy, can we narrow it down? Big book, six, four through five. All right, what, what did the Jews call this? I already told you, Shema, okay? This was the Shema, that comes from here, here Israel. Shema literally means here, and it's based on the verbal imperative that starts the verse. Now, if you did some investigation in the early sources, they would tell you that Deuteronomy 6.4 would have been the first portion of the Torah that Jesus or any Jew committed to memory. Now, according to the Babylonian Talmud, Jewish boys were taught this biblical passage as soon as they could speak. As soon as your child learns to speak, the first thing he says is not data, it's Shema Israel. They taught him this. And I've told you this before, I think it's so important, to the Jews, for the first 12 years of their life, all they learned was Torah. By the time they were 12, a Jewish boy knew the first five books of the Bible by memory. That was his education, his soul education. They spent every moment going over the Torah, memorizing it. Then at 12, then they started teaching him some things. And I don't mean they were teaching him Torah, they were just memorizing it, learning it. Then from 12 on... What if we took our children and just taught them the word of God? Nothing else until they were a certain age. And then we start teaching them some other things they might. You know, at school, they really don't learn anything that prepares them for life. It doesn't seem like anyway. You know? And then from 12 on, they went to Beth Midrash, which was interpretation, learning what this means. And they also taught them a trade. Every Jewish boy would learn a trade. So he'd always have something to fall back on if, you know, if he wasn't that good in the Torah, he could, fall back on, he could fall back on his trade. So all the rabbinic schools of Jesus' day agreed on the greatest commandment, all of them. When asked what it was, they would say, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now when asked what is the second commandment, Shammai school would answer, anybody know? Keep the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. See, they put the Sabbath law above loving your neighbor. See, Jesus, we know what Jesus' answer is, right? Love your neighbor yourself. They put this above that because they said the Sabbath is about God. And so that comes ahead of your neighbor. 
Now, if your neighbor's in trouble on the Sabbath and you're from Shammai's school, too bad. You're dying on the side of the road. It's the Sabbath. Hey, bless you, but I'm keeping Sabbath. That's where they were at. They didn't care. Now, when asked what is the second commandment, Hillel's school would answer, love your neighbor. Jesus' answer, we already know that, was the same. It was love your neighbor. Love your neighbor came seventh in Shammai's school. So the debate in Jesus' day was how to interpret the Torah by deciding the greater and the lesser commandments. And we see this idea of greater or lesser commands in Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 19. He says, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So this expert in the Torah, he agreed with Jesus on the first two commandments. But then he goes further and he asks a question. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who's my neighbor? Now, I think this is a genuine inquiry. And Jewish learning involves question and answers with more questions. If you went to a rabbi and asked him a question, he would answer your question with a question. But the question made you think. The answer was in the question, but you had to dig. And then if you asked the rabbi a question, he would come back with a question. If you just answered, it was over. The discussion was done. So it was continual questions, as long as there was a question. And it was very, it was just a system that made you think. Today we want everything handed to us. They said, we're going to work you through this. And they asked a question that would, you know, bring it about. <clears throat> and when Jesus, was, who was a rabbi with authority, was asked, where do you get your authority? What did he tell them? He says, uh, John the Baptist, where did he get his authority? And they're like, well, see, he, he, he didn't, did he answer their question? Yeah, he got his authority from John. I believe John was a smeaked rabbi also. But he tells them, where did John get? He's, he's making them think. Now, the term neighbor here is used in the Tanakh in a twofold manner, wider and more general, narrow and more specific. In its common uses, it includes anyone we come in contact with. And in other words, it's just having respect for our fellow man. In its specific sense, it signifies the one who is near to us by blood or habitation. I think that's how we think of it. It's the person next door. Now, by comparing Scripture with Scripture, we get an idea on just what neighbor means. And look at this Scripture, Exodus 11, 2. Speak now in the hearing of the people that each man ask from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor for articles of silver and articles of gold. Who's the neighbor in this passage? The Egyptians. You think they thought of the Egyptians fondly? But he is calling the Egyptians who were in, they were in bondage to, he said, ask of your neighbors. Strangers, along with neighbors, are representative of those who, those who we are to love. In the same chapter where we find this command to love our neighbor, we find this. When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you are aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So neighbors not restricted to those who are our friends or even those we know. Now, some of the rabbinic schools taught that fellow students of the law were neighbors. See, they, had to, they were debating this among them. Well, who's your neighbor? And some rabbis would say, well, it's fellow students of the law. So that way it was limited to scribes and Pharisees. Some of the rabbinic schools taught that it was wider than that. They taught that your neighbor is every blood relative, every friend or person living in your locality, in the community. Other schools taught it was much broader. They taught that every Jew was a neighbor, but only Jews. No person could be a neighbor if they were not a Jew. Some schools were much more liberal. They taught that pagans and Romans were neighbors. Now, when asked, who is my neighbor, Shammai would answer, the religious Jew. That's it. Hillel would answer, the religious Jew, even the non-religious Jew, he even included the pagan and the Roman. And he did that because he said, they were created in the image of God. So he said, we are responsible to love them. Now, if you ask them, either one of these schools, what about the Samaritan? What would their answer be? No way. No way. See, even Hillel did not consider Samaritans to be created in the image of God. They were sub 
human. They hated each other, Jews and Samaritans. So when asked who is my neighbor, Jesus answered this lawyer's question with the parable about the good Samaritan. Let's look at the parable and see if we can understand then really who it is we are to love. Because this is Jesus' answer. He's going into who is my neighbor. And Jesus replied, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him, and went off leaving him half dead. All right, so here is a man, he's stripped, he's left half dead. You know, without his clothing, we have no idea of his cultural community. Is he a Jew? Is he a Roman? Who is he? We don't know. He's naked. He's, he's half dead. You know, it's really hard to identify people without their clothing. Because we wear certain uniforms, you know. Different groups have different uniforms they wear. And we, you know, he's a redneck, he's a punker. He's, you know, we, we identify people by their clothes. This was so brought home to me when I went to boot camp. Because on the way down there, I'm with all these other guys. And, you know, some are rednecks and some are this and hippies. And, you know, we got all these different kinds. When we get to boot camp, they shave all our heads and give us all blue uniforms. And look around, everybody looked the same. You didn't know what group. If you didn't know him before, you didn't know what group to put him in. Well, that's this guy. He's laying there. We don't know where he's from. We don't know if he's a Pharisee. Is he a priest? Is he a Roman? All we know is that he's a dying man in need. Now, note here, and it's very important, the text says he was half dead. Now, half dead is significant. It says, and by chance, a certain priest was going down on the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. All right, this priest sees him and he goes by. Now here, culturally, this is hysterical. Because you think, all right, he passed by on the other side. Right away, we start thinking of a two-lane highway. Okay, and, and the guy's laying over there on the side of the road in the dirt. And so this guy goes way around him. That is absolutely hysterical. Because culturally, this road was mostly a single-lane path on the side of a mountain. It would be hard to avoid. This is the path along the Wadi Quilt from Jerusalem to Jericho, a 3,500-foot uh, 3, descent. And it's just a path, a footpath. that you, I mean, they would literally have to try to step over this guy who's laying there on the side of the road. So it's not easy to avoid this man. All right, so this priest comes down and a Levite, and they're both full-time servants of God. They're on their way home from serving in the temple. How do we know if we're going towards the temple or going away from the temple? Huh? They're going down. Okay, where's Jerusalem? Up. All right, that's a Hebraism. Jerusalem is always up. It's the city of God. It's the mountain of God. You go up to Jerusalem. Anywhere else you go down. I don't care what direction you're going, you go down. All right, so this, they're going down. So they're, they're on their way from the temple. The priest is of the party of the Sadducees. All right, he's a religious Jew, and he goes out of his way to walk by a dying man. Why? Why didn't this man who was supposed to be giving himself in the service of God want to help a man who was in need? Is he just some religious hypocrite? How could he claim to be a servant of God and ignore this man's needs? I mean, the Bible says, love your neighbor. Why didn't he help this man? Do what? Okay, he is keeping Torah. Look at Leviticus 21, 1 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, No one shall defile himself for a dead person among his people. Remember the man, this man's half dead? As a priest, he couldn't touch a dead body. That would make him unclean. Now, he doesn't know whether this man is dead or not. This man's laying there half dead. But he was not willing to risk corpse impurity to take a chance to help this man out. In the eyes of the Sadducee, this prohibition in the Torah superseded all humanitarian concerns. This is more important than helping somebody, to them. This is a greater commandment. To him, the commandment of touching, uh, not touching a dead body was greater than loving your neighbor. That's how he interpreted Torah. All right, the Levite is also a party of the Sadducees. He avoids the man also because Torah says he can't defile himself. He's obeying Torah. Now, what's interesting, and, and we don't have a clue about this unless you study the culture, 
The parable that Jesus is giving is a common Jewish parable. You find this a lot in the rabbinic writings. The rabbis would use a priest, a Levite, but the third party in the story was always a Pharisee. Okay? So this expert in Torah is a Pharisee. And he's expecting Jesus to say, then along came a Pharisee. And he's like, yeah, we're the heroes in the story. You know? Because all the Pharisees said that the commandment to love your neighbor is greater than the cleanliness code. So the Pharisee's probably getting puffed up and he goes, yeah, that's right. Then comes the Pharisee and we help the man out and we're the heroes in the story. Every Pharisee that was serious about what he believed would have helped this guy. Well, then Jesus absolutely blows the guy's mind when he says this. But a certain Samaritan. What? That's not how the parable... Wait, that's totally different than the parables. I mean, the, no rabbi did that. What is Rabbi Jesus doing here? A Samaritan's on his journey. And he comes upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. He came to him, he bandaged up his wounds, poured oil and wine. He put him on his own beast. He brought him to the inn, took care of him. These religious Jews ignore the guy. Here's a Samaritan. Here's a guy who's not even human who's taking care of this man. Who were the Samaritans? They were a mixed race of Jew-Gentile. They worshiped God in the wrong manner. They worshiped God in the wrong place. The Samaritans were hated by the Jews. The Jews and Samaritans were bitter enemies because of racial pride. I mean, this division, and hopefully you got some idea of this division from our study of Acts. We've seen it in there. They hated each other. The Samaritans were not human, according to the Jews. Uh, look at a few scriptures here, just to set the context here. John 4, 9. The Samaritan woman, therefore, said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? I'm a Samaritan woman. For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. She's like, wait, you're talking to me? I don't, Jews and Samaritans don't talk to each other. She was shocked. She couldn't understand why he was talking to her in a friendly way. No, and besides that, a man and a woman would never talk. So this is really your blowing culture all apart here. I love this text in Luke 9. Um, they go and they enter into the village of the Samaritans, Jesus and his disciples. And uh, they wouldn't receive them. They said, no, you, the Samaritan says, you get out of here. You can't stay here. We don't want you around. You're going to Jerusalem. We don't want anything to do with you. And so then the disciples say, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn them up? <laughs> this gives you a clear picture of the hostile relationships between them. The Samaritans they won't, won't allow them to spend the night in the village. And James and John, they're ready to just, let's fry them. They're not even human anyway. Let's just fry them all. You know, by the way, this is coming from what most people call the beloved disciple, the apostle of love. Let's fry him. No, Lazarus is the apostle of love. Uh, we won't get into that right now. <clears throat> All right. There's no rabbinic school that interpreted the term neighbor liberal enough to include those detested Samaritans. None of them. The scribes and the Pharisees considered Samaritans as the most hated people on earth. Now, our text tells us that the Samaritan felt compassion for this hurt man. Did either the Levite or the priest feel compassion? No, hey, uh, even Torah, too bad, suffer. They walk by. The words here, felt compassion, literally convey the idea of the heart convulsing. We might say, I was squeezed by what? Have you ever seen a case of tragedy and human need and you felt the pain from it? You, your heart just goes out to that person, we would say. The Greek word used here for felt compassion is splagonizomai. Splagonizomai is only found in the Gospels, and every use is always related to human need. The same words used three times in Mark of Jesus' compassion for human need and suffering. He sees this man, and his gut just goes out. He feels like, i got to do something to help this man. He feels it. Now remember, the Samaritan Bible is the Torah. What did the Samaritan decide about love your neighbor? He said, it's greater than the cleanliness laws. And the Samaritan, we have to understand here, he risked more than ritual defilement. He could have been implicated in the crime. Remember, this is a hated race. 
if a despised Samaritan had been found with a man who'd been brutally murdered, it's not likely that he'd have got away without being charged with that crime. This good Samaritan, because of his compassion, he is literally risking his life to help somebody. He's putting his own life on the line. And I think that's hard for us to grasp culturally, but let me try to help you see this. K.E. Bailey, in his book, Peasant Eyes, writes this. An American cultural equivalent of this good Samaritan would be a Plains Indian in 1875 walking into Dodge City with a scalp cowboy on his horse. How big would that go over? He says, checking into a room over the local saloon and staying the night to take care of him. Any Indian so brave would be fortunate to get out of the city alive, even if he had saved the cowboy's life. You know, if an Indian comes into town with a scalp cowboy on the horse, do you think any cowboys are going to ask questions? No, there'd be guns blasting and that Indian would be dead, all right? And that's the Samaritan. He's risking his life. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> to help this man. Well, Jesus then asked this man who's an expert in the Torah. All right, he tells, him the, he tells him the story of the Good Samaritan. Then he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor? Which three? Priest, Levite, Samaritan, right? Who's the neighbor? The Lord shows our neighbor is any person. Well, let me, let me back up a bit. Most commentators looking at this text would say your neighbor is anyone with a need. In fact, in October 1996, commenting on the Samaritan, I said this, the Lord shows that our neighbor is any person whose need we know and we're able to meet it. That's what I said. I don't think it's right. Who is our neighbor? Well, he says, which of the three? Well, it's the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. So the neighbor's got to be one of those. Which of these things proved to be a neighbor? Who's my neighbor is the question. Which one of these? Well, which one is it? Well, who's the neighbor I have to love? He said, the one who showed mercy to him. It's not the guy that's beat up. The neighbor's the one who showed mercy, which was who? The Samaritan. That's the neighbor. Who is it I got to love? It's Samaritan. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, listen, this is going to rock their world. Wait a minute, we hate Samaritans. They're not even human. How can you tell us that? Jesus is forcing this man to say, even my enemy is my neighbor. You go love your enemy. And you know, that's what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, that we are to love our enemies. Uh, let's look at it. In Matthew 5.43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemies and hate your enemy. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. All right? Love your enemies. Jesus said that they had heard, you shall hate your enemies. Where did they hear that? Where does it talk about in the Bible about hating your enemies? No one knows the text? That's good, because it's not in there. As far as we know, this expression does not occur in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, or in any rabbinic Judaism. There's no writings we can find that says, hate your enemies. But it is found in the writings of Qumran. Now, the people of Qumran had withdrawn to the wilderness to await the end of the age. They were considered the sons of light and equipping themselves through intense discipline and rituals of purity and scriptural study to overcome the enemy, their enemy, which they considered the sons of darkness. Now, in their writing, the Manual of Discipline, which was found in the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they had that discovery, they found these Manuals of Discipline from Qumran, and it read this way. To love all the sons of light, each according to his lot in the counsel of God, and to hate all the sons of darkness, each according to his guilt in the vengeance of God. So that's the only writing we can even find that talks about hating your enemies. So Jesus is quoting from the writings of Qumran. And he's teaching us, they're not, we're not supposed to hate our enemies. We're to love our enemies. Now, you've got to understand, this is completely radical teaching. It's radical. This is powerful teaching about the inclusiveness of love. 
It embraces even our enemies. Now those listening to Jesus that, that day must have thought this is an impossibility. To us today, you read those texts and you're like, mm, come on. Love my enemies? I have trouble loving my friends. You know, love my enemies? How could anyone love his enemy? Enemies don't invoke any kind of love towards them. But Jesus wanted to make a point that he considered our neighbor to include our enemies. In other words, listen, nobody is outside or should be outside the scope of our love. We are called to manifest love to all people. People, I think this is very relevant in our culture. There are Samaritans in our culture. Let's talk for a minute about love. What is love? In our culture, we use the word love to mean just about everything what the Bible means by it. You know, we say, I love French fries. I love my dog. I love my wife. Now, if I put my dog and my wife in the same category, I'm in big trouble, okay? It's already a little tension there anyway. Uh, <laughs> a little competition between Rocky and Kathy, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> the Greek language is rich in synonyms, all right? Its words often have shades of meaning which English doesn't possess. In the Greek, there are four different words for love. There is the noun storge. This word speaks of love of family. It's a love used of parents for child or child for parent or for a husband or wife. So this is, you know, storge. Jesus doesn't say storge, your enemy. Have this strong affection. He doesn't say that. Then there's the Greek word eros. Eros is erotic love, sensual love. It's sensual. It's what you know, people would describe in our culture as falling in love. It's a passionate attraction towards the opposite sex. This word is not used in the New Testament, in the Word of God. Then there is the Greek word phileo. I think we know what that means, right? What's the city of Philadelphia? It's brotherly love. Okay, this is love of friendship. You know, that you would love your friends. It's, this, it's a feeling of tender affection towards somebody else. The word Jesus used in our text is agapao. This Greek word is rarely used in Greek literature prior to the New Testament. In the New Testament, the word agape took on a special meaning. It was used by the New Testament writers to designate a volitional love as opposed to purely emotional. See, because we think of love as emotional, and that's why when Jesus says, love your enemies, you said, I don't feel good about them. I love my wife. How can I love my enemy? How can I have the same affection toward my enemy as I have toward my wife? He's not saying that. Agape is a self-sacrificial love expressed by divinity, not so easily by humanity. And it seems as though the early Christian church took this word out of its obsoleteness and made it a characteristic word for love. Agape love is a response to someone who is unworthy of love. The concept of love is derived at the cross, God loved the world and he gave. That's we see love. This was a response to unworthy people, to sinners, to those who were his enemies. That's agape. It is a love that proceeds from the nature of the lover. It's a commitment of the will to cherish and uphold another person. It's the only word ever used to describe God's love. It's a decision you make. It's a commitment you have. To treat another person with care, with thoughtfulness. Jesus never asked us to love our enemies in the same way we love our dearest friends or our family or our spouse. He used a different word because it's a whole different concept. The word love, as used by our Savior in our text, could be seen as synonymous with mercy. Have mercy towards your enemies. That's what he is saying. And that's what we see in this text. He's talking about a merciful spirit. He's talking about tenderness of heart that disposes a person to overlook injuries and treat an offender better than he deserves. They're cursing you, you're blessing them. When they come to spite you or persecute you, you don't respond, you pray for them. This is a love that he's talking about. It doesn't do with, deal with emotions. We, we have to understand that. We'll never understand the command to you know, love somebody. We can't control your emotions, how you feel about them. Jesus says, love your enemies. In this verse, we find the meaning of enemy. Clearly, the enemy, he says, and pray for those who persecute you. So enemy means people who oppose you, people who try to hurt you. 
Persecute means to pursue with harmful intentions. It might include the severe hostility. Uh, the same Greek word for persecute is connected with murder in Acts 7.52. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who previously announced the coming of the righteous one. In Matthew 5.44, Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. I think prayer for your enemies is one of the deepest forms of love. Because it means that you have, you really want good for them. You know, you might do nice for your enemy, even though you really don't want to do nice. You're just kind of social pressure or whatever. You're doing something for somebody, but you really don't want to do it. You don't really don't care about them. But when you pray for somebody, when you enter into the presence of God, interceding for someone on their behalf, you care about them. And it's not a prayer that God, when he says pray for enemies, he doesn't say pray that lightning will strike them, pray that they'll get run over by a car. That's not the prayer he's talking about here. You heard the new country song, pray, I pray for you, you know, and I pray that you get run over. I pray, it's, you know, it's, that's not the prayer he's talking about here, okay? Rather, he's saying we should pray on their behalf to God, pray for their conversion, pray for their repentance, pray, you know, that God would do them good. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you prayed for an enemy? When's the last time you prayed for our president? I don't think we're all that fond of him. But do we pray for him? Is that, that's the biblical pattern. And I don't mean pray that God would smite him. I'm not saying that. You know, I might have prayed that a time or two. But that, that's not what he's saying here. And praying for your enemies. Listen, here's what we have to understand. This is a Christ-like behavior. This is what Christ did. Look at uh, Luke 23, 34. Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. All right, people had just whipped him, bloody, stuck him on a cross, drove nails through his wrist and his feet, and he's hanging there and he said, Father, forgive them. He's praying for those who hung him on the cross. He's unjustly condemned and tortured to death, and he prayed for those who did it. That's our example. You want to be Christ-like? That's the example. We could also use Stephen. If Jesus is too high an example for you, I can't be that. He's God. All right, how about Stephen? We see the same thing. He followed the example of the Lord, praying for those who killed him. Acts 7, 59. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And saying this, he fell asleep. I really believe, can't prove it from Scripture, but I really believe that this stuck with the Apostle Paul. Paul was there when this happened. He hated Christians. He's killing Christians. And as he's killing this Christian, this Christian says, don't hold this against them. This is something Paul doesn't understand. Saul, I should say, at that time. And I don't think this ever left his mind. Maybe he thought of it later as they were trying to kill him. When we pray for our enemies, people, we are engaging in a God-like act. We are interceding for them as Christ intercedes for us. We are beginning to see them through Christ's eyes. What we have to understand also, if you have someone you don't like, someone you hate, someone that's your enemy, and you pray for them, prayer changes you. Kathy and I first moved here to Tidewater. I met another Christian at work. We got to be friends with their family, closer than I wanted to be. He had the kind of personality that just annoyed you. Or me, anyway. Okay? He always wanted to borrow something. And I don't mind lending things, but he wanted to borrow things you don't borrow. You know, some things you just buy. Okay? You don't borrow those kind. And he just, I told Kathy, if I'm coming home from work, and he, if they're at our house, call me so I can get mentally prepared. I mean, because I just didn't like his personality. You know? Um, I went to see. He went to see also. He was involved in the hostage rescue. This was back in 1980. And I began to pray for him every day on the ship. And I just prayed that God would protect him, God would take care of him, you know. And when we got back from sea, something really weird happened. He changed. I liked him now. But then I discovered he didn't really change. I changed. You know why I liked him? I've been praying for him every day. How do you pray for someone every day and not begin to care about that person? I don't think you can do that. I cared about him, and we became friends. I really was his friend. Prayer causes our hearts to reach out in compassionate love for others. Perhaps why, that's why Jesus encouraged us to pray for our enemies. 
we pray for them, we're going to care more about them. It's hard not to like somebody you're praying for. All right, we know who our neighbor is, and we know how we're supposed to treat them. What does this parable of the Good Samaritan say to us, 21st century American Christian? I mean, what's it have to say to us? I don't know any Samaritans. Do you? Who are our Samaritans? So we, so we just say, well, culturally, this doesn't affect us. There are no Samaritans today, so we're cool. No. What did Jesus say? He's saying, love that person. Now, to the Jew he is talking to, love that person you hate, you despise, you see as subhuman. I believe he's saying the same thing to us. You love that person who you despise, who you think is subhuman. Who are our Samaritans? I don't know. You probably have different Samaritans than I do. Right? I think there's some Samaritans in our culture from my perspective. The Bible calls them sodomites. We call them homosexuals. And, and this movement is growing, and it's in your face, and they're shoving it down our throat. But I'll tell you what. Biblically, we're commanded to love them. Now, I think homosexuality is a sin. No, make no doubt about that. Okay, the Bible teaches it is. But you know what I also, te- I also believe? Adultery is a sin. Fornication is a sin. Lying is a sin. We pick out one, and it's maybe more detestable to us than others. But I'll tell you what. We're going to have a really hard time reaching that culture if we treat them like Samaritans, subhuman. You know, I really believe that if we treat them with love and respect, not accepting their sin, of course, but I don't think we should accept anybody's sin, but we still have to love those people because none of us are perfect. So it might be someone different for you, but you have a Samaritan. Those you just, you don't think they're quite human. Whoever that is, we're to love them. And that doesn't mean we feel good about them. It doesn't mean we are affectionate towards them. What it means is we treat them with respect. We have mercy towards them. We want to see good for them. That's tough stuff, people. Okay? It's tough stuff. I'd rather deal with some complicated subjects of eschatology and try to figure out the depths of it all than deal with something practical like this, because this hurts. You know? This is like, ah, oh, really, Jesus? We got to do that kind of stuff? Jesus is saying, I want you to love the person who you think is the most disgusting person, the one you despise, the person you don't even view as human. I want you to love them. Now remember, let's just for our refresher memories, remember what love is. Love gives. Love seeks the best of the object loved. It's a commitment of will to cherish, uphold another person. Jesus said, love your enemies. He's talking about a merciful spirit, tenderness of heart, which disposes to overlook injuries or treat the offender better than we deserve. Some people are enemies not because they even wronged us. We just don't agree with the way they live. If you're a Christian, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, then listen, you are called by Jesus Christ to be his disciple, his Talmudim. A disciple is someone more than anything else that wants to be like the teacher. See, if you're a student in that culture, in the Hebrew culture, a student is someone who wants to know what the teacher knows. I'm a student. I want to know what that teacher knows. A disciple is someone who wants to be like the rabbi. I don't just want to know what he knows. I want to be like him. That's why they follow the rabbi 24-7, learning everything. I want to be like you because you're God-like and I want to be like you. If you're his disciple, then you should be loving your neighbor as yourself because that's what Jesus did. That's what he taught. That's what he lived. And we're to do the same. We're to be followers of Christ. We're to act like Christ. We're to do the things he did. Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this all men will know that you're my disciples. Not by our doctrine. Not by anything. But he says, if you have love one for another. They'll see that love demonstrated and they'll say, those people are different. They're followers. Rabbi Yeshua HaMashiach. But wishing to justify himself, he said, Who is my neighbor? Our neighbor includes our enemies. No one should be outside the scope of our love. That's what we're learning here in this parable. We are called to manifest love to all people. 
If we love people like we are called to do, do you think more people would be open to listen to our message? Do you think they would? I think they would. I mean, you can walk up to somebody, hand them a gospel track, you know, read this or go to hell, you know, walk on. And they're like, hmm, okay, that's an, I like that person. You know, you can be the one who's always, you know, critical and, you know, but if someone in your neighborhood, someone at work, someone you're, con- they just feel like you really care about them. You're different. You care about their best interests. You have good things to say. You're not putting them down. You're not like other, they're going to say, what is it? What is it that St. Francis said? Preach the gospel at all times. All times. When necessary, use words. Do you understand the power of that saying? And he's saying, in other words, the gospel is preached by how you live. Everything you do proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then when it's necessary, use some words. Tell them about it. But I think that's, you know, our message has to be seen. There's got to be a difference. Why we tell people about the gospel, you know, you got to come to Christ and he'll change your life and do all these ones. Well, I'd look at your life and I'm, <laughs> you know, is that what I get? I'm not sure I want to sign up for that. I think it'll open people up to the message we have. I really do. But I believe it starts by loving people. Because I really think that people don't care how much we know or what we know until they know how much we care. And when they know how much we care, I think there's going to be an openness to hearing what we have to say. Now, that's tough stuff. I understand that. So let's pray.